atmospheric pressure it is one of my favorites so a lot of explanations will be shared tonight and I hope they help you for the future right now you have a claim a mountain and you ever realize they have trouble breathing like you're like ah, the air is thin or you feel out of breath well it's actually true there's less air at the top than at the bottom and that is why we feel funny because the atmospheric pressure is less at the top than at the bottom our body is designed to handle the atmospheric pressure at the bottom right and so that's why we are at ease we are comfortable at this area like at sea level however when we fly up or when we go up and you feel that change when you go up into a plane and stuff like that i mean the change in the the density of the air your body knows what's going on right now the air forming the earth's atmosphere stretches upwards a long way very far up and it stops after a while when we get to space because space doesn't have any air its weight exerts a large pressure at sea level known as um, it was measured at 10 to the 5 pascals and this pressure acts equally in all directions so the gas molecules closest to earth are packed together very tightly and pressure is lower the higher up you go into the atmosphere hence gas molecules are not as tightly tight not, not as tightly packed and you feel it you feel it right now why don't we usually feel atmospheric pressure right because the pressure inside us is equal to the pressure outside us so therefore is it pans out right so we don't feel atmospheric pressure because the pressure inside of our bodies is similar to the atmospheric pressure outside of our bodies, therefore it balances out. Now we're going to deal with examples of atmospheric pressure. So we have a collapsing can. What do you think is happening when air is being sucked out of a plastic canister? Why does the canister deform or shrivel? Well, if you think about pressure and atmospheric pressure and all that jazz that we were just speaking about you know if you're sucking out air if you're sucking out air if air is being removed out then you're decreasing the pressure the pressure that was once balancing out with the pressure on the outside is much less in here and therefore atmospheric pressure now is winning the war and that atmospheric pressure will cause the can to like bending on itself right look like crumpled tissue the Marburg hemisphere so here's another example the vacuum pump was invented by von Gurick the mayor of Marburg about 1650 he used it to remove the air from two large hollow metal hemispheres fitted together to give an airtight sphere so good was his pump that it took them two teams, each of eight horses, to separate the hemisphere. So now, airless, so therefore you have no kind of, um, no force at all pressing on the outside, no atmospheric pressure, no pressure at all pressing on this to come away. And so what's going to win? Of course, atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is going to win keeping it attached because there's no counteracting pressure on the inside to push against the walls on the inside to cause it to open up. There's nothing overcoming the pressure felt by the atmosphere, the pressure exerted by the atmosphere. Drinking straws. When you drink, your lungs expand and air passes into them from the straw. Atmospheric pressure then pushes down on the surface of the liquid in the bottle and the, it is now greater than the pressure of the air in the straw and so forces the liquid up into your mouth, right? So here we have a bottle of something, maybe soda pop, and the person is sucking on that, so I'm going to put some lips. And of course, if we decrease the pressure in here, it's going to be small, 
the pressure that's existing in here is going to start to press on the liquid and this pressing on the liquid is going to cause the liquid to move up right into the straw rubber suckers are moistened and pressed onto a flat surface and the air inside is pushed out like those little rubber suckers that people use to buy to stick up toys in the car like you would have like a teddy bear so this is the wall surface the rubber sucker and so you have a little bit of air inside here the water has a little sealant and you would have atmospheric pressure basically pushing against that so you know you have this on the squeegees that you bathe with in the back so yeah now pressure gauges off measure pressure gauges measure the pressure exerted by a uh, fluid and fluids are either liquid or gas like I explained to you in this section before this now pressure gauges measure the pressure exerted by a fluid liquid or gas and we have different types of the board and gauge which works like a uh, blow toy we have the mercury barometer and this is a simple instrument used to measure the pressure in atmosphere it is made of mercury all of this is mercury and then we have an upside down cylinder and a, and a dish right the height of the mercury column is proportional to the atmospheric pressure and so you do know that pressure can be read in meters centimeters and millimeters it can be read like that so the pressure experience is 75 centimeters in fact that's the height from this point here the level of liquid here to the meniscus of the uh, mercury okay so since there's a vacuum at the top of the tube the pressure at y is due only to the mercury above it right so this is y right here and that's the pressure exerted right there so the mercury barometer um given the following data calculate the atmospheric pressure pa indicated by the barometer so the density of mercury so we're using um, this and we have the density which is 13 600 kg m cube so we're using this equation to solve the question calculate the atmospheric pressure so we're calculating pa and we have the density and we know the gravity is 10 newtons per kilograms and then we know that the height is 75 centimeters and we could convert that to meters by dividing by um, 100 so we have 0 0.75 meters and if we do a, a simple calculation we see one three six hundred times ten times point seven five will give us one hundred and two thousand pascals. <coughs> right? I said pascals because the units we're gonna get is newtons per meter squared. So I just round I just made the equivalent now a manometer, this is an instrument used to measure the pressure of a gas. So whereas this one is used to measure the pressure of the atmosphere, the mercury barometer, a manometer would measure the pressure of a gas. So one arm of the YouTube is exposed to the atmosphere and the other is connected to the gas supply which is here. And the difference in the levels of the liquid in the arms of the gas of the tube indicates a difference in pressure between the gas and the atmosphere so the gas is pressing down very really hard okay and it's pushing it up so the height here would be the pressure felt plus the atmospheric pressure if you do it like that but the pressure felt will be the height here right so given the following data, calculate the pressure of the gas supply assuming the liquid in the manometer is mercury 
and so we have the atmospheric pressure is this the height is 20 the density of mercury is that and the gravitational field strength g is this so what is it to calculate again <laughs> calculate the pressure so we calculate the pressure of the gas supply okay so we must include the atmospheric pressure as well so we have the atmospheric pressure being 10 to the 5 pascals plus the excess pressure which would be the height so the height is 0 0.2 meters times 10 newtons per kilogram times the density which will be 13,600 kilograms per meter cube and so we calculate what's in the brackets first so 0 0.2 times 10 times 13,600 plus we end up getting 127,200 this goes, that goes this goes this goes too and so we end up with newton meters which is practically pascals pascals right there right so 127,200 pascals Okay, so that's how you calculate that. That's how you calculate um, pressure in a manometer. So you must include, the, if it's open, if it's open to atmospheric pressure, you have to add the atmospheric pressure that will be acting on the column. And we measure from the point from where the gas will be adding pressure to. And then we measure between here. So this will be what we measure, this distance between here. That's, that will be the pressure, right? So I also have um, this type of barometer measures atmospheric pressure and so we have the aneroid barometer, we have the drying rate there. So an aneroid, a no liquid barometer consists of partially evacuated thin metal box with corrugated sides to increase its strength. And this I can't explain to you how it will work. You would just have to, if you have one in your lab you could see how it works or you could even go on youtube and type in aneroid barometer i'm pretty sure somebody will be on there who shows you how to work one here's another one another pressure gauge another pressure gauge um well it's the same one aneroid barometer the box is prevented from collapsing by a strong spring if the atmospheric pressure increases the box caves in slightly. If it decreases, the spring pulls it out. A system of levers magnifies its movement and causes a chain to move a point over a scale. And it's used in aircraft altimeters, meaning the higher up you go, it wants the, the, the higher up you go, the less pressure you would feel. So, therefore, that would determine um, how high you are. Again, so basically, higher up, less pressure. So, for this one, if you go higher up, then the box won't cave in. If you're coming down, it will start to cave in, right? Because remember, the pressure would increase as you fly back down to earth because there's more air and the larger air column acting on whatever is inside the plane. Okay, so we're now going to deal with atmospheric pressure and weather and how it affects the weather in case of a hurricane. So with high regions, so regions of high atmospheric pressure called anticyclones are accompanied by clear skies and sunny weather. When one has formed, it often does not move for several days and covers a wide area. On the other hand, a cyclonal depression is associated with a region of low pressure and usually brings widespread rain. A hurricane is a severe cyclone with winds of 75 miles per hour or more 
which spiral inwards towards the storm center, which is called the Eye of the Storm. Um, it is anti-clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere and clockwise in the Southern Hemisphere due to the wind patterns. And pressure decreases rapidly towards the eye. Rainfall and wind speed increase but fall off suddenly on reaching the eye where the temperature can be 10 degrees higher than usual. You know, in my country, we experienced the eye of a storm for Hurricane Georges. And when we, we thought that it was over, we went outside and we were like, yay, the Hurricane got It was really bad. It was a category 5. Bad, 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 bad. Lifting up people's roof, uh, pulling out people's doors, busting people's windows. And then we started to feel like this sudden gust. So we were like, oh, it's the eye of the storm. It was really hot. It was really hot in the eye of the storm. It was bad. Oh my God, I hope we never get a category for a hurricane like that again in my lifetime. Just bad. Now, large amounts of energy are released as the hurricane forms. On average, we experience eight hurricanes in the Caribbean annually. It doesn't mean that it comes directly to your, re your area in the region, but you will hear about some popping up all over. It affects people differently. Like, Maybe the hurricane might be going south, maybe it might be going north, maybe it might be going slowly. So it seems like a northwesterly movement. Um, so, yeah. So our bodies are designed to work at normal atmospheric pressure. That's why if at the atmospheric pressure acts on us, we don't have body fluids coming out because what's inside, the pressure inside, is equal to the pressure outside so we could handle that but at high altitudes breathing becomes difficult because the pressure higher up is less right and so that could cause that could cause um your insides to swell because then the pressure will be acting against you and then nothing is there to balance out that pressure so you could swell that's so come sometimes when people have um aneurysms and stuff like that they can't fly out because of that um, low pressure in the air. And so because of that, aircrafts that we travel in are pressurized. The inside is pressurized. So it could keep us at a comfortable, um, keep us feeling comfortable and not feeling like, huh, even though our ears pop, it's way better than if you don't pressurize the cabins. So it safeguards us so we don't have any swellings, any on call for liquids coming out of our bodies because the pressure inside is so much greater than that outside you know so we good to go girls and boys we good to go why does my ear pop at high altitudes inside your ear there's a pocket of air and this pocket is normally at the same pressure as the ear outside so in here in the middle ear right in here is like a pocket of air right and so it helps you to hear, but if the air pressure around you changes, you feel the air pushing on your eardrum. And that's the problem. Your ear has a small tube for equalizing the pressure between the inside and outside of your ear that is open when you swallow. And when the pressure is equalized, you often hear a pop. And that's why you're encouraged to yawn. To but I have locked jar. Not my locked jar, but the hinge just popped out. But yeah, when you yawn, you kind of fix the pressure for a little bit, right? You kind of fix the pressure for a little bit. You kind of equalize it a little bit because of that tube. Because you know your throat and your ears are all um, they work together. If you have a really nasty cold, you know the esteen tube this tube right here right once your chest becomes under pressure and you have all that cold in it the cold if you don't get rid of it by coughing it up maybe you don't like coughing or sneezing or blowing it out your body is gonna be like huh okay there's a volcano up in your chest and we're gonna find a way to get out we're gonna explode and it will come straight through your extreme tube straight out your ear and you can just see the cold dripping out Ooh, so make sure you blow your nose okay so again inside your ear there's a pocket of air 
and this pocket is normally at the same pressure as the air inside your ear and to help you hear what if the air pressure around you changes you feel the air pushing on your eardrum and so your ear because this um, there's a small tube for equalizing the pressure between the inside and outside of the ear that is opened when you swallow and so that's the estrogen tube Right, so you open ah, the ear going up. Uh, when Kyle was up to yawn, and that was nice. Because you know, with yawning, it tells the body to wake up, it wakes your brain up, keeps you alert. Right, sorry about that. Now, in a plane, the high altitude means it is thinner, and all the planes are pressurized. The air pressure is still much less than on this surface. This difference in air pressure can be felt by the ears, particularly when on takeoff and landing. When changes in altitude make the pressure difference happen um, a little more quickly. So your body is unable to adjust um, slowly. Why do you think air popping occurs? What helps this problem? And again, that's the difference in air pressure inside the air. And to help that problem, some people would tell you to chew, some people would tell you to yawn. So you could allow the ear to equalize through the estrogen tube inside of your ear. Right? Um, so a scuba diver meets high pressures and different dangers. Remember we spoke about that. And uh, we're going to learn why. And that's simply because I don't even have a can or a bottle of soda because I don't drink that stuff. But what happens is that it's like this. A bottle, the liquid inside soda is basically under pressure, right? And under pressure meaning that you don't even realize that it has carbon dioxide in it. And so it looks like everything is okay. But what happens when you open the bottle? When you open that bottle, you realize that you would have relieved, relieved the pressure on the inside. And that pressure will come out and that carbon dioxide that was held comfortably inside of that liquid is going to start to froth up, froth up because now the pressure is off. The pressure is off of it and now it's, it wants to come out of solution. And that's pretty much what happens with divers. When they go below the surface and they go too deep, then the gas in their blood becomes, um, it's pressured, it stays there. Right? And in there, nitrogen um, is also pressured, it's bubbled into the blood and it goes in there. Now, the thing is with nitrogen is that it can cause something called the bends. Because when you come up too fast to the surface, that those nitrogen bubbles that were absorbed into the blood, they now bubble out because now you've relieved the pressure on the blood. And so the nitrogen now comes out and gets in the blood and it can cause little air pockets in your arteries and stuff like that. And that's, and it goes between your joints and all that causes a burn. You could die from it, right? So it's the high pressures nitrogen dissolves in the blood and on return to the surface too fast, he would suffer the painful and sometimes fatal condition called the bends. And this is when the nitrogen gas form bubbles of nitrogen in the blood vessels, right? So you want to be careful about that. And here we have the hyperbaric chamber that's used to remove the nitrogen from your blood slowly, right? So you're going there at high pressure and then it slowly releases pressure on your body so that the gas could be diffused out of your blood properly and not rushfully and then when you look your body is like <laughs> bam spasm dead right so that's what that chamber does um pretty much yeah. and now we're at the question section um i don't think we'll be able to do much of this but let's do this one so it says an open-ended and closed tube manometer connected at different times the same gas cylinder as shown in figure 20.9 a and b this and this the mercury barometer reads 750 millimeters assuming no loss in pressure from the gas cylinder k 
calculate the pressure of the gas in the cylinder. So if you read 750 plus this height, then the pressure will be that plus that. So this um, pressure of the gas will be equal to um, 100 millimeters. Can remember to your height could be taken as um, pressure, and then we have 750. See what was read, and that will give you 850 millimeters and pretty much the height of the mercury in figure two once it's closed look at the same gas the gas that's being pushed through here it will pretty much be the same thing right the height is indicative of the pressure felt so it'll be the same thing now a simple barometer um is shown at to scale in figure 20.10 so a simple barometer is shown not to scale in figure 20.10 right and we it looks familiar it says what is a a is definitely the vacuum that's the area that is airless b what holds up the mercury in the tube the atmospheric pressure Um, what is the value of the atmospheric pressure one in uh, centimeters the mercury that's 74 centimeters in uh, Pascal's if the density of the mercury is um, 1.3 times 10 to the 4 so we would say 1 Remember, it's pressure equal to rho GH, so we're going to say 1.36 times 10 to the 4 kgm, 3 times 10 newtons per kilograms times 0 0.74 meters. So we, we change that up, we divide by 100 to get meters, and we should get... 1.36 times 10 to the 4 times 10 times 0 0.74 and we get 100,640 so we get uh, the answer for this will be 100,640 pascals. What would happen to the to this reading if the bar barometer was taken up a high mountain? Yeah, it will be less. It will be less because we have less air up there, right? So it will be lower. What would be the height of a water barometer if atmospheric pressure is 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals and the density of water is that? So the height, so we have atmospheric pressure, so we have, we have atmospheric pressure, we have that, we have the density, we have the gravity, but we don't have the height. So we're going to just say height is equal to PA over rho G. And that will give us 10 to the 5 newtons per meter squared divided by rho, which is 10 to the 3 kg over meter cube times 10 newtons per kilograms triple triple um that goes that goes and that so you'll have meters so therefore it's gonna be 
10 because this will be 10 to the 4 so 10 to the 5 divided by 10 to the 4 will be equal to 10 meters so let's divide 10 to the 5 divided by 10 to the 4 I give you 10 hope you got that and how I did that some a little, little math 10 to the 5 over 10 to the 3 plus 1 because when you have this you add so you end up with 10 to the 5 over 10 to the 4 when you divide exponents you just minus 10 from each other and up with 10 so that's that now it says what is the height of a mountain if the reading on a mercury barometer falls by 10 centimeters when it is taken to the top of the mountain assume the density of mercury is 1.3 times 10 to the 4 kilogram per cubic meters and the average density of air is 1.3 kg per cubic centimeter okay so we could probably work this out So I could draw a mountain. And we could say that the pressure at the bottom of the mountain, right? We're talking about the air. So the air is a fluid, so we're going to deal with it like that. We would say that you're going to feel, you're going to be, um, Pressure would be 10 to the 5, atmospheric pressure by the way, Newton per meter squared, and that will be equal to 1.3 times 10 to the 4 kg per meter cube. And we have the density. That was the density, right? So in the mercury, I assume the average density of air. Okay, so says what is the height of a mountain if the reading on a mercury barometer falls by ten centimeters? when it is taken to the top of the mountain assume the density of mercury is that and the average density of air is that so we're using the density of mercury here yeah, times gravity which would be 10 newtons per kilogram time h and we're going to divide this by all of this so we're going to say h is equal to 10 to the 5 newton meter squared divided by um 1.3 times 10 to the 3 i mean this go and I look back with newtons per meter cube and so that's gonna go that's gonna go, that's gonna go, that's gonna go and we're gonna be left with zero point seven six nine meters and then at the top of the mountain now we're gonna say well no so now we're going up to the top and it says that what is the height of a mountain of the reading on a mercury barometer falls by 10 centimeters. So we know that going up to the top now is to 0.769 meters 
minus 0 0.1 meter and that will give us 0 0.669 meters and from that we could work out the pressure felt up here so you say pressure is equal to rho gh and we say um, the same density of the mercury, mercury times 10 to the 4 kg over m cube times 10 newtons per kg times the height sorry times the height which is 0 0.669 meters and if you do a small calculation you will get pressure of 8,6970 Newtons per meter squared. Okay, so we have pressure right there. So let's assume the density of mercury blah, blah. So now we have the thing. And it says dense and the density of air. So we had the mercury because we're using the mercury barometer at the bottom and at the top, right? Now all we're going to do, we're going to use this figure to figure out the height of the mountain and we're going to use this figure with the air so we're going to say now that delta p is equal to rho g delta h right and basically we're gonna yeah i'll come in just now so it's a 10 to the 5 Meters square minus the eight thousand six hundred and eighty six thousand nine hundred and seventy newtons per meter square is equal to one point three kg per meter cube times 10 newtons per kilogram times delta H. <sighs> You're probably like, signing out. Why did she work that out? Well, because it was there, okay? And I just decided to work it out. If you have an easier way to work this out, let me know because this is what I worked out. I actually had to do the pre-workings. This is not me just coming with it. I had to do the pre-workings before I put this out there. If you have an easier way, feel free to share. You could always send me a little video on on YouTube and post it up. Okay? It doesn't hurt. And this will give us a height of 1,002.3 meters. Which is approximately one kilometer. The audacity. The audacity. Alright, so we're moving on to floating, sinking, and flying. Let me see where we at. Right, so we almost done this. Let's see if we could finish it in 20, well, 15 minutes. That's all we have on the camera. So floating, sinking, and flying. Where do things sink? Why do things float? Yes, because things sink because it will be heavier than the liquid or fluid they're in, right? But sometimes it deals with the orientation of whatever you're dealing with. For instance, ships are really big. Because of how they are built, right, they could float on seawater. They have a lot of air pumped on into the middle of here, down here in the hull, which makes it lighter than the water, less dense, and it can float on the water because of its orientation. Now, if you roll up the ship, like if you take that same ship and roll it up in a ball, like a ball like this, that same shit, you got rid of all the air, the space, the air sacs and all that. Now you just make it nice and perfect for piercing the fluid like water. 
and it's gonna just sink right down to the lowest deepest depths <sighs> right so basically it's the density and the orientation of a object that causes it to float or sink and we're gonna deal with Archimedes principle a ship floats because it gets support from the water any object in a liquid whether floating or submerged is acted on by an upward force or thrust force and this force makes it seem to be less than normal when a body this is a principle by the way when a body is wholly or partly submerged in a fluid the up thrust equals the weight of the fluid displaced or pushed aside that's why it floats right So basically, when, uh, like in this case, in this case, here, yeah, come on. In this case, we have water. The water rises when you place a rock in it that's heavier than the water. The water that's this place would be equal to the weight of that because this took up the space this took up the space here this was the space that it took up it's not in there but it took up that space so again when a body is wholly or partly submerged in a fluid the up thrust equals the weight of fluid displaced are pushed aside right so a fluid means liquid or a gas and the case of gases will be dealt with later. When a body floats in water, the up thrust equals the weight of the body. The net force on the body is zero. This is the case of the principle of flotation, right? So when a body floats in water, the up thrust equals the weight of the body and the net force on the body is zero. This is the case of the principle of flotation. A floating body displaces its own weight of fluid. So it's pushed aside. That weight is pushed aside. Ships. A floating ship displaces a weight of water equal to its own weight, including that of the cargo. The load lines called a plimsoll mark on the side of a ship show the levels to which it can legally be loaded under different conditions. Why is a boat allowed to take a greater load in summer than in winter? Because in the summer, we're dealing with density, right? In the summer, the water would be not would not be icy, and you know that ice water, ice is less dense than water. That's why it floats on its liquid counterpart so in the summer the water is not icy so it's more dense than the water when it's cold and therefore we could have heavier things on the water right because summer water is more dense so the denser the water the more weight it can carry so hot water is denser than cold water right now submarines, why do you think submarines sink? What do submarines do? So what submarines really do, they suck in water into, I don't know what you call that down there. They suck in water and so they increase their weight. The weight becomes greater than their up thrust and so they start to sink. So once the submarine is submerged, the up thrust is unchanged with the weight of the submarine increases with the inflow of water and it sinks faster the more water you add in right so why do you think a submarine resurfaces because it blows out the water from the bottom of the submarine and now we're dealing with floating with ships and submarines and balloons so we deal with a cactus and diver and this is an experiment you would do in the lab I have yet to do it because I'm always pressed for time and I don't even have a bottle of water here. 
But anyway, this has to do with pressure being applied. And when you squeeze, when you tend to squeeze it, the bottle with water in it, water would end up going inside of maybe a, like you can get something like a tea drop where you cut it off, or you could even use a pen cap, right? And so when you squeeze the bottle, it would force water up inside of this, what we call the cartesian diver, and it would sink, right? And when you relieve the pressure on the outside of the bottle, the water would now leave the inside of the cap and it would just nicely move back up, right? So in the Cadison diver, the pressure on the car forces more water into the bulb and the diver's weight increases and he sinks. So this, why are we talking about this is because I want to tell you that when you increase the weight of an object by, you know, adding water to it, it will sink. So the weight would overcome the upthrust force and it will sink. Whereas if you remove, if you remove the, the weight, which is the added water, it would now float to the top because now the upthrust force is greater than its weight. So that's where they tend to use this as an example in labs and stuff like that because they want to get it in your head that things float because the upthrust force of it would be greater and things sink because its weight would be greater than the upthrust force. So again, things float because its upthrust force would the upthrust force of the object would be greater than the weight of the object and things float because, so things sink because the weight of that object will be greater than the upthrust force. Right, so in this case, weight is greater than the upthrust force, and in this case, weight is less than the upthrust force. Well, we went under that fancy twizzle. Anyway, what do you think would happen if pressure is decreased? Well, yeah, water will shoot out from inside of that and it will shoot up to the top. Balloons. A balloon filled with hydrogen weighs less than the weight of air it displaces. And that's because air is made up of all the different types of gaseous molecules. It contains carbon dioxide, which is very heavy. It contains um, argon, it contains all these neon, um, chlorine, fluorine, oxygen, right? But hydrogen is very light and so you would have balloons floating. The upthrust force is therefore greater than its, its weight and the resultant upward force on the balloon causes it to float. Now, ships, submarines, and balloons still, so balloons are used to determine whatever weather is afoot, and we call these meteorological balloons, which carry scientific instruments called radio sons, and they are sent up into the upper atmosphere. They transmit whatever signals back to Earth with information about temperature, pressure, and humidity and they're trapped by radar to give data on wind direction and speed. We floating is also, so basically these are things that take advantage of floating. And remember floating is only achieved once um, the upthrust force is greater than the weight of the actual object. So these are just examples of things that take advantage of floating. Because we already went through Achidemides' principle, and not in depth, but, but however, we will come again to it somewhere, right? But um, yeah, so these are examples of floating occurring and how they're taken advantage of, and so we use it for decorative purposes. Maybe I should put that in the slide somewhere because we want the connection. So it's used for decorative purposes, um, it's also used to test the weather, it's also used in uh, breweries to determine the density of drinks, right? And the density of drinks is important because you want to know, the, the more sugar, the more sugar uh, uh, fluid has, the denser it becomes. So if you're making, if you want standardized solution if you want standardization 
to be across the board so that if I drink, I, I don't know if you drink tea, if I drink tea or malt from from um, one country, drinking tea or malt from another country should be similar. Or drinking tea or malt made in that country should taste the same every time it's made. So that's why we use hydrometers to test the density of the liquid, the float in the liquid, right? So here it says, this is an instrument for measuring rapidly the relative density of a liquid and the hydrometer is placed in a liquid and the scale read at the level of the liquid surface. The denser the liquid, the higher it floats, the numbers on the scale increase downwards. Okay, so the more dense, the more it floats. A hydrometer, this is another example. This is, I think this is the hydrometer, this is the hydrometer again. So the large bulb gives the instrument buoyancy and the, and the small weighted bulb makes it float upright and the narrow stem increases the sensitivity that is a small density change causes the instrument to float much higher or lower so the thinner the stem the more sensitive it is so once you have a very thin stem hydrometer you know you have a very sensitive instrument right so there's very little room for error when it comes to measuring. You have to be careful when you use it. So I hydrometers enable the state of a car battery to be checked, which is an easier way to check a car battery to see if it's still good or not. Kind of car battery is used up. It's a chemical reaction happening in there. And once you start using up chemicals in there, the solution will become less dense over time. Oh, uh, where else are hydrometers used? Right. In breweries such as wines, such as drinks and stuff like that. Like malt. And a malt needed a hydrometer. Malt needed one. 